Cheers. Breaking Bad is definitely a landmark in TV history. To someone who grew up watching the serials of the 1960s, a show with that level of technical and thematic complexity would be somewhat surprising. There's no doubt that television as an art form has grown and improved over time through continuous experimentation with the format. Breaking Bad didn't come out of nowhere. Vince Gilligan and the writers of Breaking Bad built on the work of the great shows before them to make something that took full advantage of what makes television unique. Since its inception, the rules of television forced producers to adapt to the unusual nature of the format. Unlike movies, TV competed directly with other shows. Changing your mind was as easy as pressing a button. Borrowing techniques from serial and radio, TV writers fought for the attention of viewers in a way movies didn't have to. Early TV showrunners used cliffhangers to ensure viewers kept coming back. To appease shorter attention spans, every show had its own contained, episodic narrative structure. Be sure to be with us again next week at the same time. What makes Breaking Bad so groundbreaking in particular is how it took the constraints of the format and used them to its advantage. Cliffhangers became an opportunity for the show to reflect groundbreaking character changes. An episodic narrative structure means that the show is rich with short stories that stick with the viewers and deepen our understanding of the characters. Many episodes are self-contained stories that don't directly move the plot forward, but give us insight into character dynamics and indirectly raise the stakes for the show as a whole. <coughs> Most importantly, Breaking Bad took full advantage of the most important asset television has, time. While Michael Corleone went from an unassuming idealist to murderous gangster, it almost seemed like his destiny. He was part of the family after all. Walter White, however, had much further to fall. The medium of television gave the creators the time necessary for Walt's dramatic change. By the final season, longtime fans of the series had spent years of their lives invested in Walter White's transformation from Mr. Rogers to Scarface. The entire series built up so much tension that the catharsis of finishing the series is virtually unparalleled in most other popular entertainment. The point is, Breaking Bad was great because it understood how to use the medium it was written in, and the same goes for any other format. Like the early TV viewers of the 1950s, we are living in the early years of a new medium. But instead of the medium of television, ours is the internet. Though some may not look at the creation of internet content as much of an artistic endeavor, online creators are nonetheless making similar creative decisions about their cinematography, editing, and even narrative structure based around the medium. Some are cleverly harnessing these constraints and using them to their advantage. Hello, John. By now you will have received my message that we will no longer be communicating through any textual means. Like television, the internet as a medium gave way to a new set of creative challenges. For the first time, the medium itself gave the consumer the same level of access and distribution as professional creators. What he has is an internet connection and a crappy camera from Walmart. And that should be enough. And I think right now, because of technology, for the first time ever, that is enough. Internet creators don't just compete with each other like television does with other shows. People producing content on the internet also compete with a consumer's own friends and family. This distinction has shaped the style and format of internet content. It's the relationship that young people have with content that they see online that they choose to watch versus the content that they see on TV, which is fed to them. What's up guys, welcome back to Dudes with Clothes On. When you think of video content on the internet, chances are you think of vlogging. And that makes sense. Vlogging is essentially Instagram come to life. Snappily edited, visually engaging videos that show off lavish and over-the-top lifestyles. Though the format is intentionally informal, these creators definitely make careful aesthetic and thematic choices to convey a sense of authenticity. The genre has some obvious and cliche tropes. Handheld cameras, talking directly into the screen, little to no color correction, and day-in-the-life storytelling have become creative choices these filmmakers use. This aesthetic style originated from a place of technological limitation, but with cheaper and better technology, the practical constraints are no longer there. Vloggers like David Dobrik have the budget and equipment to shoot their vlogs like a traditional documentary or a reality television show, but they don't, and that's because they know that the vlog format plays to the strengths of the media. On the internet, content creators compete with their audience's own family and friends. They keep the authenticity and lack of polish to make their content fit in well amongst the Instagram stories of the family and friends you actually know. Dobrik is a great example of someone who has really captured this style. His vlogs are flashily edited and focus on a lavish lifestyle, but at the end of the day, they rely on the authenticity of a group of friends having fun. His episodes feature a wide-ranging cast of characters, each with a particular brand. Dom is a player, Jason is old, and Josh is a washed-up actor. The semi-scripted format, combined with the authentic-feeling vlog aesthetic, blurs the line between staged moments and reality. Clickbait, clickbait. Oh my god. Oh my god! Get a thumbnail, get a thumbnail, quick, get a thumbnail! <laughs> no matter how ridiculous the scenario, Dobrik has a real knack for making content that 
feels like a day spent hanging out with your friends. So it's no surprise that he's so popular on a medium that values social networks. Vlogs like these are successful not just because they feel real, but because they are hyper real. His vlogs channel the innate desire people have on the internet to edit and craft their own online image to mimic the seemingly fun and carefree life of Dobrik and his friends. Yet it's always crucial that these vlogs don't feel too produced. An amateur quality maintains that authentic, informal feel. And this informality does not just exist in vlogging. It's also popular in other genres of internet content. I'm sorry, I'm so, ranting. It's I okay. Listen, this is what we're, we're, we want to give you an opportunity to communicate. A great example of a format that could only succeed on the internet is the long-form interview podcast. While this interview format definitely borrows from traditional radio, shows like the Joe Rogan experience capitalize on the at-your-own-pace nature of the internet to explore a topic more fully. You can see and maybe like an interview that isn't great that like that person doing the interview is just leaving a lot of change on the table mm. like maybe they'll like ask something but because they're just thinking about the next question and because yeah. like this is just some sort of formula like they're not really looking at the guests uh, speaking of uh things hawaiian we have to talk about this pineapple jumpsuit Oh, what? we do have oh, to talk about that. That's fantastic. Wow. We have to talk yes. about yes. it. Yeah. So nice. Rogan and other podcast hosts present their interviews not as formalized interviews, but as conversations. The advantage of this style is that guests relax and often say and do things they wouldn't normally do. I think when I was, I don't know, five or six or something, I thought I was insane. Ideas get fleshed out, and we get a seemingly more honest look at the interviewee. It's nothing like the traditional talk show. You can kind of right. see, like, maybe they kind of wanted that topic to be explored a little bit deeper. But it's important to remember that this style is still an interview tactic. While it seems unproduced and unpolished, it's no doubt a conscious decision on Rogan's part to elicit a specific reaction out of his guests. This informality, authenticity, and on-demand availability makes these shows perfectly suited for the internet. Their success makes sense on a medium where people expect transparency and love discussion. Self-expression and personality thrive in the podcast format and on the internet in general. People on the internet simultaneously play a character and act like themselves. These podcasts further blur that line. While vlogs capitalize on the image making of the internet and podcasts capitalize on self-expression, a third genre capitalizes on another equally important part of the internet. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Kickstarter Crap. Hey little stinkers and welcome back to YouTube.com. What's up Greg? Welcome back to my channel. What's up you beautiful bastards? Hope you having a fantastic Tuesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Commentary channels are another genre unique to YouTube and internet content. Whether they're political, humorous, or dramatic, they all take advantage of the medium in a similar way. Like vloggers, commentary channels speak directly to the camera as a way to incorporate their viewer into the broader conversation. Channels like iDubs, H3H3, Drew Gooden, and many others engage in pre-existing discussion about news or internet content. If a podcast is like a social media post and vlogs are like somebody's profile, then commentary channels are the comment section. These channels constantly respond to each other, highlighting content they find problematic and engaging in a level of meta-commentary that often requires a lot of existing knowledge on the topic. It makes sense that content responsive to audience discussion became so popular on the internet. Television shows on NBC don't have a comment section, but internet content creators are constantly bombarded with comments and opinions. Today, guys, I am reacting to perhaps the most requested video of all time. As a result, creators often take that feedback and change their discussions. The highly discursive nature of the internet has allowed content creators to enhance their content by being a part of the feedback loop. Smart creators use this feedback loop to incorporate their audience into their content, giving them an almost personal stake in the story. Though vlogging, podcasts, and commentary channels all vary drastically in style, they all understand the constraints of the internet and leverage those constraints to tell a more thematic and engaging story. So what does the future hold for internet content? Who is telling a story that pushes the boundaries of what the internet can do? What will be the breaking bad of the internet? Of course, only time will tell, but I think there is one creator who takes advantage of all the strengths of internet content. Shane Dawson. Man, in some quick industry news, we should talk about Shane Dawson. Shane Dawson is the king of YouTube. Shane Dawson. Shane Dawson. Shane Dawson is doing a documentary on Logan Paul's brother, Jake Paul. 
Okay. But in the past year, Shane Dawson has definitely challenged our assumptions of what internet content can be. These whole documentary and series have just been over the over the top. It's really amazing to see that this has become kind of a site-wide event. So I watched The Mind of Jake Paul, like all of it, which is weird because YouTube drama, not a big part of my life. But I was interested in this because it looks like we're living in a time where the entertainment of YouTube is starting to become more legit. Shane's long-form documentaries on controversial YouTubers and conspiracy theories get as many views as primetime television shows. In a space that's so diverse and fragmented, the videos seem to unify the community. But as of recording this video, it's at 7.8 million views. And it's such a big site-wide event, we usually see a drop in the number of people watching our video during the first two to three hours of release of a Shane Dawson video. In these videos, Shane Dawson borrows the techniques of commentary channels, long-form podcasts, and the vlog to tell his story. Like commentary channels, Shane saw the cultural relevance of this topic and seized the opportunity. By entering something ongoing and incredibly popular, the docuseries was thrust to the forefront of internet culture. Not only did he enter and provide his own take on the discussion, he went to the source himself, creating perhaps the most complete and valuable entry into the discussion. Shane actively participated and even edited later episodes to respond to up-to-date criticism. Because Shane is not just releasing a finished eight-part series, he's editing it and adapting it in real time based on the response from the community, and the community is responding to his response, and it's a self-fulfilling cycle that never ends. This technique invested the viewer in the production of these videos, and this participatory storytelling suits the internet perfectly. Then, in another bold decision on Shane's part, he decided to make the series extremely long form, an eight-part series totaling about seven hours of content. On a platform known for short, snappy videos, this change gave him the time to delve into the matter thoroughly. The informal one-camera setup, coupled with the fact that he kept roughly one interview per episode, kept his interviewees relaxed, much like how people feel on the Joe Rogan experience. While his conversations were no doubt edited, the internet allowed him to slow down the conversation and have a full picture of the situation, providing many different perspectives. Finally, and most importantly, he intentionally filmed using vlog aesthetics and editing that captured the advantages of the medium. By speaking at the viewer, Shane engages the YouTube community in a very YouTube-specific way. It seemed only fitting to investigate Paul using Paul's own format. Yeah, because I'm normally with the camera. Yeah. Yeah. The vlog aesthetic gave that same friendly feel we get from internet creators like David Dobrik. The format stays the same, but their lives get stripped of much of the glamour. Silence is not cut out, the camera is less frantic, and the subject matter is much heavier. Shane picks apart that seemingly authentic vlogging style of David Dobrik and Jake Paul and exposes how scripted and stale those lifestyles can actually be. Pretty much everyone that's a little bit older knows that it's all fake. In doing so, he ironically creates something even more authentic, a story even more suited for the internet. The reason the series had so much authority and worked so well was because Shane produced it so authentically. At its core, it was about understanding a person, and what better way to do that than as friends hanging out and having fun together? Shane's series might be the first of its kind. I certainly can't think of a vlog series that's not only so widely popular, but boasts this level of technical and thematic complexity. Shane Dawson has done so well on YouTube because he understands the stories the internet throws on and the techniques necessary to tell them. So maybe looking at something like Shane's vlog through the lens of the medium explains why the series was so popular when it came out. And maybe like the writers of Breaking Bad, Shane captured how to use his medium to craft a message. Or maybe the format of internet entertainment still has a long, long way to go. And people are going to get sick of some guy online telling you what to think. But I sure hope not. One of the many benefits of the medium of the internet is its accessibility. The drawback is that it's almost as easy to make low quality content on the internet as it is to consume it. When it comes to something like video editing, I don't want to waste time trying to decide what content is worth learning from. If I'm going to learn a new editing software, I would enroll in a high quality and efficient editing tutorial online, like the Adobe Premiere Beginners course on Skillshare. Skillshare has over 20,000 high quality classes on many topics ranging from editing to creative writing. The first first 500 people to click on the link in the description will get two months of completely free access to Skillshare. That's editing tutorials plus thousands of others from marketing and video editing to photography. Thanks for watching and a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video.